Mr. Vice-Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, it's my very great pleasure to welcome the Reverend Richard Coles, who is to deliver this year's Alumni Lecture, formerly known as the Convocation Lecture. As many of you will know, if you switch on your radio at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning, you will hear Richard co-present the weekly Saturday Live on Radio 4. He's also Vicar of Findon, near Wellingborough. Having hung up his microphone this morning, after the broadcast, and before preparing for his church services tomorrow, he's come up to Leeds for this lecture. We're therefore particularly pleased that in this busy schedule, he's found time to return to the University of Leeds, where he was a student 10 years ago. In his autobiography, Fathomless Riches, available in all good bookshops, <laughs> He reveals with frank and brutal honesty his difficult years leading up to and beyond his success as a member of the Communards, whose number, Don't Leave Me This Way, stayed at the top of the UK charts for four weeks in 1986 and was a worldwide hit. His life at that time seems to have been one filled with sex, drugs and rock and roll. <laughs> Not normal items in the CV of the average parson. <laughs> nor indeed in the application forms for registering to study in this university. <laughs> but his autobiography goes on to say that he later enrolled at King's College London as a mature student where he read theology and got a first. He later came up to this part of the world for ordination training at the Anglican Theological College at Merfield near Huddersfield. In those days, the College of the Resurrection at Merfield used to send its ordinands to study for a degree at this university. Those who hadn't already studied theology came to us for our BA in Theology and Religious Studies. Others, like Richard, who had a degree in theology, were sent to us for a research MA. Thus it was that Richard came to the University of Leeds in 2004, an arrival that caused great excitement in our departmental office. Our secretaries, one of whom I'm delighted to see in the audience today, told everyone in sight, and probably further afield as well, that one of the communards is coming to be one of our students. <laughs> Richard chose as his research topic an examination under my supervision of the textual variants of the Greek in St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I shall refrain from the very strong temptation to go into autopilot and deliver a regulation 50-minute lecture on the textual criticism of the Greek New Testament. <laughs> Suffice it to say that Richard produced an elegantly written and well-researched thesis that had no difficulty in being passed. A bound copy of that dissertation now sits in the Brotherton Library. It has the same title as his autobiography, namely Fathomless Riches, referring there to ta hooper balon pluton in New Testament Greek. I was gratified to read in his autobiography, on the very well-thumbed page 257, <laughs> I had started a research degree at Leeds University looking at the textual history of the New Testament, a minority interest. <laughs> But I loved it, and I think I had a feel for it. A new edition of the Greek text of St. Paul's Epistle to the Ephesians had been published, and I decided to look at that. He states that he enjoyed the subject area and found the study rewarding. I dine out on that. <laughs> Armed with his MA, and having been ordained deacon, later priest in the Church of England, Richard duly served his title at St. Botolph, Boston, the church known as the Boston Stump. I caught up with him later when he had become senior curate at the posh high church of St. Paul's Knightsbridge. It lies behind Harrods. But I also noted that it was very conveniently situated for Richard easily to cycle across Hyde Park to Broadcasting House where he resumed working for the BBC, appearing in many TV and radio programmes. 
As I said at the beginning, Richard now has his own parish. He's vicar of St Mary the Virgin in Fyndon in Northamptonshire, the county where he was born and raised. Like many another Northamptonshire family, Richard's had been involved in the footwear business. His father ran Coles Boot and Shoe Limited. Its factories are now no more. Richard instead deals in souls. <laughs> Different spelling. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> it's clearly time for me to pass you over to our speaker, the Reverend Richard Coles, to give this year's alumni lecture under the title Dancing in the Isles, a personal itinerary from gay pride to gay marriage. Richard, we look forward to what you have to say. Dearly beloved. <laughs> How nice it is to be back in Leeds. I'd like to say that it's been a while since I was last here, but actually I was last here on Thursday, so uh, <laughs> not that long ago, uh, doing the rounds that I do, giving actually um, a keynote address to a conference of insurers on the subject of trust. Rather a tested concept in that particular field at the moment. <laughs> and Leeds, I always have a sort of great connection here, because every time I arrive here, which is by train, I look at the facade of the Queen's Hotel, that noble building where my great-grandfather died in 1936. He died over, according to the local newspaper, an early morning cup of tea. If I were to say to you that in our family, early morning cup of tea has become shorthand for a, short, a relationship of short duration, perhaps you'll understand <laughs> <laughs> the meaning of that was. I mean, I'll give you a bit of sort of background with some context thing. Uh, Keith's quite right. My family, typically of many in Northamptonshire, uh, were shoe manufacturers. Um, uh, my great-great-grandfather was, in, uh, was a silk weaver in Desborough, and then with enterprise and a bit of grit and also uh, the dynamics provided to him from liberal politics and Baptist religion, uh, he kind of raised himself slightly above the throng, became a clock repairer, and then drew those two things together, uh, working in uh, kind of producing textiles and at the same time working with machinery, and he became an inventor of shoemaking machinery. He also, he claimed, invented the bacon slicer, but forgot to patent it. If he had, I probably wouldn't be here today. <laughs> but anyway, he kind of caught that rise of industrialization of manufacturing in, uh, in the East Midlands, and uh, the making of shoes began to uh, enrich him and indeed the family. His son-in-law inherited, he was the one who met his untimely end in the Queen's Hotel. Apparently my father was still bribing the porter 10 bob into the 1960s, but there you go. Uh, he inherited it and then had the unusual good fortune, I hesitate to use good fortune, bearing in mind the season of the year, but the First World War came along. The First World War, catastrophic in so many ways, was very good for the shoe and boot trade, as you can imagine. And so he became enriched further. Great expansion in the industry in those days. His son inherited, he caught the Second World War, another big market for the manufacturing of boots. And so by the time my father took over at the uh, end of the 1960s, beginning of the 1970s, and I was born in 1962, it was a pretty stable, settled sort of life. The entire county was employed, it was felt like the entire county, was employed in shoe manufacturing, full employment, and that produced a sort of... Uh, I suppose, a sort of prosperous, prosperous section, uh, a boss class, if you like, who lived in Kettering's equivalent to the Bishop's Avenue, which was Barton Seagrave in those days. You knew you were posh because you had those little green chips in your red driveway. That was the sign of <laughs> real prestige. That was the world I was born into, a world that in many ways would seem pretty settled, I thought. And the future for me, I think, would have been the future that my father had expected too, uh, to grow up, to stay local, to work in the shoe industry, uh, to marry, to have children, that kind of thing. And of course that wasn't what happened. What did happen, uh, that did follow the pattern, was I went to a local independent school, the same one my father had gone to, and my grandfather had gone to, and every male in my family had gone to. And that school, undistinguished in many ways, was extremely good at cricket and extremely good at music. Cricket was not for me. 
Uh, music, however, was. And I found my way into the choir at the age of eight and found my feet in the Anglican choral tradition, which was to have a surprisingly lasting effect. Um, I loved the music. I loved the people. I loved the atmosphere. I loved the ethos. I loved so much about the Church of England. But I completely failed to connect at all with the content, the doctrine. For already by the age of eight, I pioneered the Atheist Club uh, in the choir. <laughs> <laughs> Ample preparation for ministry in the Church of England, you might think. <laughs> and me and my best friend Matthew Gamage, also an alumnus of this university, used to sit at the back playing poker dice during the sermons in a rather ostentatious way. So I remember very little of what I was told, but my experience now is in reflection is that, as the Jesuits rightly observed, uh, it's, you know, take the child of seven and you will in inevitably see or uh, in the future see the son, the man, the woman, the whatever. And that was true for me, I think. The only thing I do remember was a textual mistake of any detail. You'll enjoy this, Keith. There was, over the west, at the west end of chapel as you left, a stained glass window uh, with that text. You'll remember, the, uh, you'll remember it from, oh gosh, is it John or Luke? Uh, Wist ye not that I should be about my father's business? Of course it's John. Christ... Uh, <laughs> Christ among the doctors, and, uh, and says that statement, wist ye not that I should be about my father's business? Not knowing at that age, the tender age of eight, uh, the peculiarities of Jacobean English, I always read it as, wish ye not that I should be about my father's business. And for that reason, thought if Jesus had anything to say to me, it was don't go into shoe manufacturing. <laughs> Excellent advice for all concerned, I have to say. And then two things happened. I hit adolescence, and uh, that was a sort of mini-catastrophe of its own. But there was a larger catastrophe happening to the shoe industry, which collapsed in the, in the middle 70s, along with so much manufacturing industry in the UK. Cheap imports came in. Uh, it, there was no it was no longer economically viable. And what had been a thriving and growing and prosperous concern dwindled away to nothing very quickly. I'm back where I started now, in a town where the main factory was indeed part of our family's firm but of course that's flats now and uh, the idea the memory of full employment the memory of the shoe i should say actually i say the memory of the shoe trade hasn't died entirely i'm not giving a great account i know of my ancestors here but i have to share this with you um when i arrived in Findon, i did a round of the people who were unable to come to church for one reason or another i went to see uh, one of my ladies uh, who's housebound and lovely woman and i talked to her and i said um what did you do and she said, well, I used to work in the, in the shoe trade. And I said, well, very good. And what did you do there? And she said, well, I was um, secretary to a shoe manufacturer. And I said, oh, that must have been interesting. She said, yes, it was. He was a great character. There were good days. He was a bit of a rough diamond. And most of my work basically entailed keeping his wife and his mistresses separate. <laughs> I then realised she was talking about my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> And I say this not just for a bit of local colour, but also to give you a sense that it was uh, Middle England, middle class manufacturing. They were, uh, I say they were nonconformist in politics when wealth came, uh, nonconformist in religion, liberal in politics. When wealth came along, of course, they became Anglican and Tory. These things happen. Um, but nonetheless, it was a world in which your place in the scheme of things was significant. There was a very strong sense of whether you were up and whether you were down, and of propriety being observed uh, formally, if not always informally, that kind of a world, kind of uh, familiar one. And into that world where, uh, a sort of Pinteresque world in some ways, where what was meant was never said and what was said was never meant, I arrived in adolescence. Now, the future that had been held out for me in the shoe trade had begun to close down. But also, I also realised that I was gay at the age of, I suppose, 14, something like that. The prospects for a gay teenager in Kettering in the late 70s were not tantalising, I have to say. <laughs> There was a unisex hair salon in Dolkeith Place <laughs> <laughs> where I got a sense that there was a kind of broader horizon to, to find, but that was not enough for me. Um, and that was really the impetus for me to... I realised that my schooling, the pattern, if you like, the kind of pattern that lay ahead was not one that was going to be one that I could inhabit, not without severe uh, damage to myself and to others. And then also I got caught smoking, and my school career literally ended under something of a cloud of nicotine. Caught once too often, it came to a sort of crisis point. The headmaster said to my mother, Mrs. Coles, we feel it's time for Richard to meet fresh new educational challenges. 
And so it was that my mother rather enterprisingly found an FE college, further education college in Stratford-on-Avon, which offered a vocational drama course. It would perhaps not surprise you to know that one thing I rather enjoyed at school was um, amateur theatricals. Um, in Stratford-on-Avon, where you could study drama and at the same time do a couple of A-levels. Basically, it was a finishing school for delinquent middle-class teenagers, I re <laughs> realise now. But that was where I went, and it was in many ways a lifesaver. It was far enough away from home and in a congenial enough environment for me to uh, come to terms, or to begin to come to terms with my sexuality and to announce that to the world, which I have to say didn't exactly reel with surprise. <laughs> I remember telling my, so it's time to tell my mother, and one hot afternoon in the summer holiday, I sat down and played her Tom Robinson's Sing If You're Glad To Be Gay. <laughs> Six times. <laughs> At the end of which she said, darling, you tried to tell me something. <laughs> uh, and that was a kind of significant moment. And, and, and once that had done, well, then it was, we were in a sort of different dispensation. And that caused great emotional turmoil. I think often you'll find with people, the statistics still bear this out now, that actually young gay people, teenagers, men or women or trans people, are still four times more likely to suffer a severe mental health crisis as part of that process of coming out. It's changed, the world has changed a lot. It's a lot more congenial, it's a lot more tolerant. But nonetheless, I think those adjustments in teenagers, so difficult anyway, are all the more difficult if you find that you don't fit in to those patterns particularly well. And I had a bit of a spectacular crash in the middle of all of that. And it was sort of in, uh, as a, the good fortune that happened after that was a sense that I, that what lay ahead for me was further afield than the world I then inhabited. I needed to get to London. I still had this sense then that London was a place where you could run away to and build an identity with some autonomy, become who you are. I know that sounds like a sort of trope from the X Factor now, doesn't it? But nonetheless, it's a powerful one. I then had the unusual stroke of good fortune of being run over on the A45. <laughs> The silver, cloud, silver lining to that cloud was criminal injuries compensation. <laughs> £2,000 at the age of 18, thank you very much. The first thing I did was get my ears pierced. The second thing I did was pay for TCP to deal with the antiseptic <laughs> issues as a result. And then the third thing I did was escape to London. And I arrived in London in 1980, bought a saxophone and set myself up in what was a very dynamic and exciting place then. You'll remember Margaret Thatcher's first government came into power in 1979 and you had this sense that there were real issues at stake. The sort of rather steady pendulum swing between Labour and Conservative was clearly swinging a bit more wildly than it had done for a while. Uh, the unions were obviously going to be faced by the Tory government and that was going to, of course, have huge effects in the middle years of the 1980s. But London was still a place that was porous enough to, uh, in which you could come there, run away there and find some room. You could still sign on the dole in those days and get just enough to live on. Arts Council grant, as we called it, unofficial. <laughs> and you could still, the really important one was access housing. You could still find short-let property, hard-to-let council property. You could still find your way to London and that's what I did. Do you have an idea of the naivety with which I arrived? Um, I found I answered an ad in one of the gay newspapers, the only gay paper then, for a flat share and found myself sharing a flat with some other people in a squalid um, apartment, they'd call it now, over a TV repair shop in King's Cross at the bottom of the Caledonian Road. I had no idea why King's Cross was King's Cross and its particular reputation at that time had passed me by. And I couldn't understand why all these ladies were waiting for a bus in the street outside <laughs> when there was no bus stop there. <laughs> But it was all right because people kept stopping and giving them lifts, so I assume they got, <laughs> they got home. <laughs> After a while, the sort of penny dropped, and I realised that I wasn't in Kettering anymore. <laughs> and then I met someone who had also run away to London, not from a sort of prosperous middle-class background that I, that I had, but a very tough working-class background in Glasgow, and that was Jimmy Somerville, who arrived at the same time, leaving behind him... Uh, some pretty tough circumstances. He too was gay, he too found a flatmate, he too was just around the corner from me. And we then met in what was then the only gay bookshop, Gay's the Word, still there actually, in Marchmont Street in Bloomsbury, where you could buy uh, all the Radcliffe Hall, The Well of Loneliness, as well as the Spartacus Guide to Europe. It was a very <laughs> diverse literary field. But at the back there was a coffee shop and round there was the beginnings of what came to be known as the alternative gay scene. It was a group of people, young men mostly and some young women, all in our late teens, early twenties, who gathered. And 
gathered in a particular place at a particular time. The first ga gains of gay liberation had come along at the end of the 60s and in the 70s, when a bit of space had been marked out where people could meet and could uh, spend some time together, get to know each other, uh, form relationships and partnerships. And uh, there was also the sense of the very dynamic, rather polarised politics of the time meant that that was very much allied with the politics of the left. The left was extremely vibrant, would be a kind word for it, I think, at that time. There was the WRP and the RCP, then the RCP fell out with the WRP and became the RCT and the RCG. It was like the early church, frankly, it really was, <laughs> like those fractious communities on the, on the Mediterranean littoral. I remember once when I decided that I was revolutionary communist tendency, going along to uh, their annual conference, which ambitiously was entitled Preparing for Power. <laughs> <laughs> But to have that sense of a sexuality which uh, was one that would inform identity in a new way and the sort of political room to give that a bit, of, a bit of theoretical rhetorical structure was a very exciting one. And that was really when the alternative gay movement began. I didn't know there was one until a sociologist came to interview me about it for part of her postdoctoral studies and said, what was it like to be one of the founders of the alternative gay movement? I don't know. <laughs> All we did was a disco on a Wednesday night in Islington, but there you go. <laughs> but it was a group of people who were very much formed on the politics of the left and yet had sufficient confidence about... Uh, you remember then in the late 70s, early 80s, a kind of gay role models for men or for women were pretty limited. It was basically Mr Humphreys in Are You Being Served? <laughs> And then if you, had, uh, if you knew an art cinema, The Killing of Sister George would give you another kind of opportunity to look at how those lives were configured and construed and, and received in those times. And that was not... I mean, they were caricatures, and they were not caricatures that we particularly felt that we could inhabit or indeed wanted to inhabit. So there, after that, a group of people got together and began to form a, a sense of a community, some shared ideas, some shared ideas about how we might live, characterised really by a massive rejection, I think, of what at that time we used to call heteronormative, I can't remember, heteronormative oppression. There was this sense, ideas coming over from Germany and America at the same time, of gay identity being an army of lovers, confrontational, fighting for our place in the world, and formed with relationships that did not conform to uh, the sort of heterosexual norm. So the idea, it's an irony for me now, when so much energy in gay activism goes into achieving equal marriage, nearly there, um, that would have seemed unthinkable to us back then, the idea that all that activism and energy would have gone into replicating um, a kind of form of existence, a pattern of life, which then just seems simply oppressive, not just for us, but also for women, for all sorts of people trapped in what seemed like a pretty narrow, ungenerous and unrewarding way of existence. It was the 80s, what can I say? And what gave that particular character and shape and dynamic was popular culture. Gay, the gay community really began to form on the disco floor. So for us, the kind of disco music of the 70s coming in from New York had a sort of anthemic quality to it, very closely related in our experience and in, in what we felt about it to what was happening in uh, black soul music, in Motown in particular in the 1960s. So much of the uh, black activism uh, uh, in that period was allied to popular culture too. Drawing on some of the tropes of gospel, remember all that stuff about, um, about throwing off the oppression of Babylon, about finding the promised land, about being led over the Jordan, that very dynamic, very kind of purposeful stuff fed into black uh, gospel music, into black soul music and transferred over really onto what was happening in disco. It might seem extraordinary to people now that the disco might be a place where a political identity could take shape and where a political community could form, but it really was the case. And also, it was ours. Gay clubs then were clandestine sort of affairs. I can remember going to one where you would literally knock on a door and a little hatch would go across like that, and someone's face, badly made up face with stubble usually, would poke out and say, and in you went. Um, but we began to mark out a little bit of autonomy, a little bit of a place to be who we were doing what we wanted to do on the dance floor. So music, and particularly popular music, disco music, dance music, became really a sort of rallying cry in lots of ways to that. I write about dancing in the arts, but actually it was dancing in the streets. Remember Martha and the Vandellas, Dancing in the Streets? One of the greatest records of that era, which produced one of the worst cover versions in David Bowie and Mick Jagger ever made, but there you go. Don't quote me. 
Um, but dancing in the streets was this idea that you could achieve in an oppressive and hostile and uh, unrelenting uh, majority culture um, something of joy, something of uh, self-expression, something that was vital and exciting and dynamic. And so the dance floor was absolutely at the centre of the formation of this community. It also gave us the idea that somehow the way to express this, the way to articulate it, was not necessarily through the normal political discourse, but was precisely through the dance floor. So, for lots of gay people, activism was very much uh, part of that experience. And so Jimmy Summerlin and I, uh, both interested in music, I think really responded to that. And lots of what we did was worked out strangely, let's make it sound like strictly ballroom before the uh, Avon La Lettre, but it wasn't that, but was worked out in the context of the dance floor and the disco. Around this time, Channel 4 started, and an enterprising commissioning editor there took advantage of new technology that came in, lightweight, easy-to-use technology, well, it was then, and a bit of budget, and said to people in London, London by now seething with kind of strange subcultures and tribes and so forth, a very dynamic place, here's some money, here's some kit, account for yourselves. And so that's what we did, a group of us called the Gay Youth Project, uh, got this equipment, got some money, and spent a year making a documentary about ourselves, which eventually uh, was called Framed Youth. And I saw it again recently, very crude, uh, very rough edges, but did manage, I think, to capture something of the originality of what was going on, this new way of living, this new community that was forming in a rapidly changing London. It also caught the eye of others, and it won... Uh, the Grierson Award from the BFI for the Documentary of the Year. Although I have to say, the chairman of the judges, when he gave it to us, gave the most grudging speech I've ever heard anyone uh, give an award by. And, as, and so, in revenge, we stole a wheel of Stilton and took it home from the buffet afterwards. <laughs> Mayor culpa. But that was all of a sudden a realisation that other people were beginning to notice the particular new shape and form of what was happening around us. But also, it was the first time Jimmy Somerville sang. We needed some music for this documentary. We didn't have any budget. I had my saxophone. I'd been working a bit, doing a bit of busking and then doing, uh, playing in other bands. So I said, well, I'll play saxophone, but we need a singer. And then Jimmy, who, if you've ever heard him speak, has in one sense a rather unpromising and gruff Glaswegian voice, not the sort of voice that you would imagine would produce song of such quality and distinction, opened his mouth and sang. And that was a moment I will never forget, hearing for the first time what became one of the most distinctive voices of that time. A voice which, in some ways, and I think why I responded to it so much, resembled a choir boy. Although I have to say Jimmy's resemblance to a choir boy <laughs> broke down pretty swiftly <laughs> after that. But also possessed something. I remember Simon Napier Bell, who was the manager of Mark Bolan and Wham and lots of other people, said once that star quality is the ability to turn the raw material of your life into your art. And that's what it was with Jimmy. There was something of howling protest, vulnerability and strength at the same time in this voice. And anyone who heard it, who had ears to hear, I think found it electrifying. I have to say, I was talking a little while ago to a rather different group about this period. It was the uh, Wollaston Methodist Ladies Over 60s Fellowship. <laughs> And I uh, realised halfway through I'd rather lost the crowd and I wasn't really sure why. And uh, at the end I said, has anyone got any questions? And a lady with her handbag on her knees sort of shyly put her hand up and said yes. And said, what was he like? And I said, who? And she said, Jimmy Savile. <laughs> <laughs> I had to backtrack quite significantly on, on that one. But Jimmy really did have that extraordinary quality and... I wasn't the only person who noticed it. We did this music for Framed Youth. Uh, and then Jimmy got together with two people who lived in the same block as him and formed a band called Bronsky Beat in 1983. Thanks to Ken Livingstone, actually. I think Ken Livingstone, a politician with some real nous about him, regardless of what you make of his politics, but then as leader of the GLC, understood, I think, better than most, quite what was happening in London, these very profound changes, uh, the kind of rise of the tribes and the subcultures of London. And to, I think, basically to annoy the Tory government, made grants to precisely those groups. You remember all the kind of outraged pieces in the Daily Mail about uh, black one-legged lesbians, you know, the sort of rather crude caricatures they dealt in then. I did actually know a black one-legged lesbian who got a grant, but that's, that's by the by. <laughs> but gave some money for a gay arts festival called September in the Pink, 
and that caused the usual sort of hoo-ha. But what it did give was an opportunity for Bronski Beat to happen. Jimmy appeared with Bronski Beat on stage. It was in Heaven, the nightclub in Charing Cross. I was there that night. And it was just obvious that a star was born. Someone from a record company was there. Bronski Beat was signed, in, I think, three days later. They were in the studio in a month. They had a single, Small Town Boy, released. It went straight into the top five. One of those breakthrough moments. I can remember turning on top of the pops and seeing Jimmy on stage, my friend, opening his mouth and singing a live vocal, while behind him, Legs and Co. did this kind of preposterous dance <laughs> in leg warmers and mullets, not really getting it at all. It was the 80s. And then all of a sudden, Bronski Beat kind of burst onto the scene and you began to see that the kind of shape and the pattern of that life and that community was finding a way into the mainstream, some representation in the mainstream. The most significant thing about Bronski Beat, of course, apart from Jimmy's extraordinary talent, was that they were out gay, and that had not really been done before. A couple of people had gone, a, had gone before, but not in a sort of organised way that Bronski Beat had. And that caused a great hoo-ha at the time. But with the extraordinary appeal of Jimmy's voice and the attractiveness of the record, that not only was a great record, but I think also it became an anthem for a generation of people who were running away to London or running away to Paris or running away to wherever it was you were running away to, to create this identity. It was, and still remains so today, although rather disappointingly last year it was used in the Boots Christmas advert. <laughs> I don't think they really got it either. Um, and so Bronski Beat happened and all of a sudden it felt like the most tremendous vindication Jimmy, I bumped into Jimmy and he said, do you want to join Bronski Beat and play saxophone? I looked at my crowded schedule, which involved two appointments at the Dole office and said, I can probably find time for that. <laughs> and so I did. I, I didn't pay my dues. I didn't go up and down the M6 in a van. I didn't play the back rooms of pubs. The first proper gig I did with Bronski Beat was the Montreux Pop Festival. So, you know, I kind of went in at that level. And it was a transforming experience, you know, a cliche almost, it's like a lottery win, but get into a successful pop band and all of a sudden the world changes amazingly quickly around you. Um, and of course, I love it now when they have lottery winners on the television, they're interviewed and they say, is this going to change you? And they say, no. And they get in a helicopter and fly away. <laughs> of course it changes you. And one of the objectives we had was to try to retain... Uh, our identity, who we were, what we felt we represented in the very uh, dynamic and in some ways exacting world of pop music. We had, uh, we had a sort of slight run up to that, made some worthy records, played some worthy gigs, including the Students' Union at Leeds University. But then we had, uh, in 1986, Don't Leave Me This Way, a record which was, in fact, the biggest selling record of the year and propelled us into uh, that kind of higher league of pop music. And that was extraordinary, actually. Um, on the one hand, an enormous vindication of who we were and what we did. I have to say it was extremely easy to get used to smart hotels and flying around the world in comfort and luxury. And uh, all those kind of things that you would, the sort of cliches about being in a successful pop band. At the same time, though, we tried to sustain values. We tried to sustain a sense of who we were because we decided that what we wanted to do was to bring down Margaret Thatcher with disco. <laughs> Nothing wrong with ambition. The timing was perhaps not great. Uh, and she proved a more durable foe than we thought. And of course that created a certain problem for us. How did we do what we did and at the same time maintain a, a sense of integrity? This was brought home to me in vivid detail uh, one day when we were asked to go to Paris to do a live concert at the Chateau de Vincennes, a big gig, us and Bruce Springsteen, who was then I think the biggest artist anywhere, in support of the French trade union movement, which was mobilising the left in France to support an anti-racism campaign. Of course we were going to do that. So we arrived in Paris and the night before there was a worthy television programme, a bit like Newsnight, which we were invited onto to discuss this. Uh, and on the other side, there was a, a rather um, dry French right-wing columnist and commentator who was there opposed to us. So there we were, simultaneously translated, and one of those long, sprawling debates that French television loved so much. And I remember the interviewer said to me, so, you know, it's a bit ridiculous, isn't it? Pop stars getting involved in politics. What have you really got to offer? It's ridiculous, isn't it? How could you possibly uh, give anything to the trade union movement in France? And I sort of answered rather pompously and self-righteously, Something, oh, well, you know, just because we do what we do, it doesn't mean that we don't uh, feel that we're absolutely rooted in this experience and that our solidarity is with the trade union movement and all oppressed people struggling to make a living in a hostile world. And there was a pause. And then the right-wing commentator leaned forward and said, 
I was behind you on Concord yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> So there were certain tensions in that position. <laughs> and those tensions began to tell on us. But nevertheless, it was something we, we continued to do. And I think in retrospect now, if we did anything really worthwhile in those days, it was actually, I think, advance that cause a bit. I think it just became a bit more thinkable to see gay people, self-identified gay people, doing things that weren't unattractive. That was the theory. And well, my dancing in the video for Don't Leave Me This Way is perhaps not so attractive, but there you go. And then the best of times, the worst of times. Gay man, early 20s, London, 1980s, the arrival of HIV and AIDS. And that hit us like, uh, like a storm. It was extraordinary to find yourself in the late 80s in a developed economy with all the resources of medicine and science and all the economic resources around to find yourself vulnerable to what felt like a medieval plague. People were getting a cough on a Tuesday and dying on Friday of a disease which would normally be um, treated without any difficulty at all by a whole range of antibiotics, and yet they did not respond to it. Of course, what was happening was the systematic collapse of someone's immune system. And it was extraordinary to find yourself in your early 20s, as we were then, surrounded by people who began to die these extraordinarily humiliating and awful deaths. Unimaginable scenario, unimaginable then. And that had a huge impact on us, of course, and realised, called us back in, it began to think again about community. We'd been out there being, if you like, kind of proselytising for the community, preaching our gospel. We have a gospel to proclaim. Well, that's a continuing theme. But we had to return to the community and deal with the issue of what was happening to people then. I have a, when I was doing the book, I, I went through a photo album, which I haven't actually been able to look at. I find it too upsetting. But I found a photograph there from 1984 of a picnic, of a party outside in Belsize Park in London. And I look at that picture, it's a crowded picture, lots of people, lots of friends. I'm the only gay man in that picture who's still alive. And it was uh, an extraordinarily difficult time. From 1986, I don't know if anyone has seen the film Pride, you might know, which was the story about a group which I helped start, uh, Lesbians and Gays Support the Miners, adopting a pit village in South Wales in 1984 during the miners' strike. One of the unlikeliest friendships, one of the most lovely and rewarding friendships grew up between these two very different communities. And Mark Ashton was the person who was really the key person in organising that, a very talented person, who was the first of our circle to die in 1986. And then that made all sorts of new and unforeseen demands on us. The shape of life began to change, looking back to the community and trying to deal together with this crisis that was so appalling and so debilitating, uh, great shifts occurred. I realised that for me pop music was not something that I could really get away with for very much longer. My relationship with Jimmy was now so difficult, musical differences as the euphemism goes, um, that that wasn't something that could continue to. And in the mess of all this, I did a stupid thing, which was take a year out and take a lot of drugs. Of course, being in a pop band in the 1980s, it would have been rude not to, frankly. <laughs> More e vicar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and interesting, of course, that ecstasy was the drug of choice. Ecstasy was a dance floor drug. You took it, MDMA, and it made you instantly happy. And for lots of people on the gay scene in those days, a little, a night of instant happiness was an irresistible offer. As is so often the case with people who get into that, people who've got more money than sense and the time to indulge it, I kind of crashed out. And the last six months of that year, I don't really remember, and mercy for me, certainly. And at the end of that, as I began to pick myself up and face the future and begin to reflect a bit more fully on what had happened, I got religious twinges. I found myself totally, to my surprise, and with enormous reluctance, thinking there was something I remembered about chapel, something I remembered about the evening canticles, something I remembered about the cadences of the Book of Common Prayer that spoke to these circumstances. It wasn't that worked out. It was like being hungry and smelling bread. And I thought, I've got to do something about this. I, of course, assumed it was the prelude to insanity, so I went to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> And the psychiatrist did himself out of a considerable revenue stream by sending me to a priest. He said, you don't need me, you need a priest. I didn't know a priest. I knew someone who knew someone who was married to a priest. I went to see her and she pointed me to a church, 
I have to say she had really good judgment because we se she sent me to St Albans Hoban, perhaps the most flamboyant high church of all the high church shrines in London. And there I turned up on a Sunday morning, very reluctantly, not wanting to be there, sitting at the back. I went in as a sceptical observer. I came out as a totally committed participant. The Eucharist, the moment of consecration, the priest lifted the host, the bell rang, I remember the bell pierced me to the soul and something within me released and I realised that this place that I thought was enemy territory and this unintelligible blurb that kind of I heard was in fact my homeland and my mother tongue and so it proved to be and I found myself then on the threshold of a whole new experience. I went through, found my feet in St Albans Hoban um, well, the wonderful, one of the reasons I do what I do now is because other people made it look possible. I'm not clever enough to work this thing out as a kind of rational exercise. I'm not brave enough to adventure in this kind of way. I need to see other people make it look possible. The vicar of St Albans, Hoban, Father John Gaskell, remarkable man, did exactly that. He made it look that you could make this commitment without too great a sacrifice of integrity or honesty and do it with a bit of fun. And that was a very powerful, uh, had a very powerful effect on me. So, uh, off I went to St Albans. I should say I did a, I was profiled last year by Fern Britton, that great cultural commentator, <laughs> and uh, involved a, a television film about me, in which she interviewed me for hours and hours. But she also wanted to speak to people who'd known me at various stages along the way, so they could come on television and say how marvellous I was. As you can imagine, that was quite a job. Um, <laughs> but I did find some people, but they couldn't find anyone to do the bit of conversion. So I said, well, John Gaskell would be brilliant, retired now, long retired. She said, well, would you call him? So I phoned him up at Morden College, where he lives uh, in London. And he said, oh, hello, my dear father, how are you? And I said, I'm fine, John, it's nice to hear from you. He said, what can I do for you? And I said, well, they're making a television documentary about me and they need someone to come on to talk about that period in my life when I found my way to church. And I thought you'd be ideal because you played such an important part of that. He said, oh, Father, you flatter me. And I said, would you be interested? And he said, well, I'd love to. There's just one issue. And I said, what's that? And he said, I'm afraid I don't remember a thing about you. <laughs> Very typical of John Gaskell, very typical of that kind of high church Anglican sensibility, which if you're tuned into that frequency, you would recognise straight away. I went to uh, St Albans Hope and I found my feet, realised straight away that I needed to engage properly with the content, which I'd failed to do before. I found my way to King's College London, had a wonderful three years there, where among the great uh, joys of that period was discovering a completely unforeseen fondness for the Greek New Testament. And so it was that I uh, was to pick that up again here. Three years at King's College London was going to get at the end of that, I think, ordained, and two things happened. One, succumbing to Roman fever that happened so often, I became a Roman Catholic and found myself for the next few years sitting at the back in a completely uh, a different environment, trying to kind of work that out on my own. And I then another way of not getting ordained in the Church of England is to go to work for BBC Radio, which is what I did. I started off on GLR, being the agony aunt for Emma Freud, on a programme produced by a red-headed chap down from Manchester called Chris Evans, whatever became of him. I'm sure there are still people around London who bear the psychological scars of my intervention. Sorry about that. <laughs> I went from there to Radio 5 and then on to Radio 3 and spent nine years presenting the dullest arts program that has ever been broadcast by any broadcaster. My father has a lifelong history with insomnia. He only had to switch on night waves at 9.30 on a Tuesday evening, cured. Uh, I loved it. It was a chance for me to spend lots of time talking to interesting people about interesting things. By now I was living in London during the week. I bought a cottage up in the country in Northamptonshire where I came from. A sense again that came along with conversion that I needed to somehow get onto different terms with my own origins, my own past, and to explore that and think about that. That was good. And started going to church up in Stamford in Lincolnshire, which is where I happened to be near at weekends. Could never shake off this idea that God had other plans. I eventually realised that the thing I learned from being a Roman Catholic was, in fact, I was Church of England. I, I missed the hymns. I missed the hymns. Of course, there's a lot in that. So I drifted back, or headed back, hurtled back to the Church of England, found it congenial. The Church of England always, of course, if you're a gay man, uh, in some ways the Church of England, particularly at the moment, might not seem like the most congenial place to be, but at the high church end in particular, has always 
allowed room, let the reader understand, for sensibilities, and indeed more than sensibilities, for identities and relationships to flourish. And I think I related to that. Although, of course, I came from a world where gayness and identity was explicit, not implicit, where it was spoken, not unspoken. And that was an interesting, jarring note sometimes, crashing into that world, coming from where I came from, uh, and not really observing the etiquette of it always. And I think that's probably quite a good thing to do, because those sort of self-silencing, self-censoring etiquettes can lead to uh, the withering of people, I think. Um, Went to Radio 3 and then couldn't shake off this idea. And eventually I got involved in politics again for the Labour Party. And it was the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Mo Molum, who really was instrumental in me getting ordained. Not on her CV, I noticed. <laughs> but Mo got fed up with me talking about, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. Oh, I want to do that, that, that. And she said you know, she'd had this brush with, uh, with cancer that nearly killed her, indeed was later to kill her very tragically. And like most people who've had a brush with that kind of life-threatening illness, she said, don't hang about... Who are you? What's important to you? Work it out. Put things in motion. I did. I phoned, ended up going to a selection conference. I remember it was uh, the Archdeacon of Lindisfarne was my chief selector. The, if, those of you who know the Anglican clergy, the idea that there's any process of selection at all might come as a surprise, <laughs> but there is. And I remember him looking at my folder and looking at me and saying... Why does somebody like you want to get mixed up with a broken down, failing institution that's lost any sense of its tradition and doesn't know where it's going? <laughs> I said, I'm thinking of leaving the BBC. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so it was that I found myself just down the road at Murfield, the College of the Resurrection, in my 40s, in the middle of a career, doing well, reasonably comfortable. All that I had to leave behind and enter... Uh, Anglican Monastic Foundation, two of my peers I've seen here in the audience tonight, and they will understand exactly what I mean if I were to sum it up as Hogwarts if written by Kafka. <laughs> <laughs> but what I learnt in there, among the why are monasteries monasteries? Why did they exist? They exist as laboratories of community, in fact. Father George, the superior of that community, once said if there was ever a murder in a monastery, there'd be 45 prime suspects. And indeed, that's true, because what you encounter... The great myth of monasteries is that they are somehow uh, escapes from reality. Exactly the opposite. They're confrontations with reality. The reality of other people at first, huh, uh, how frustrating they are. And then the realisation that actually it's the confrontation with yourself and the limits of your competence, your aptitude, your marvellousness, your history, all that stuff. It's when you get beyond that, it begins to get interesting. And you engage with something that really gives shape and form distinctively to those communities. And that is the reality of Jesus Christ. Not as a kind of abstract exercise, not as a sort of uh, interest in traipsing around a museum, not as something aesthetic but the reality of the risen Jesus Christ, what that means to you, what that says to you, how that forms you, and when it does, how that forms the other people also being formed around you. And so it was that I learnt that great lesson, which was um, the place of the risen Christ at the heart of communities. And that, of course, immediately took me back to where I'd come from. What I discovered there, ironically, was a return to what I discovered in the gay community, however many years earlier, in the early 1980s, something to do with the reality of people, something to do with enduring love, something to do with resilience, commitments, faithfulness, discipleship, discipline, all those profound virtues that have become in some ways so marginal or so hazy, so difficult to grasp in lots of the ways we live now. And so it was I found myself ordained in Boston Stump in Lincolnshire, took my first faltering steps as a curate and learned some more about how communities function indeed in Boston, how communities dysfunction. Medieval church, choral and floral, 18th century buildings around it. Behind that, some of the toughest lives I have ever encountered anywhere. An estate decimated, destroyed by heroin, where people were living chaotic and disorderly lives, tough, tough lives. And beginning to understand, what I did understand, begin to understand there, was I thought, I assumed, that life would be better that I could make investments now that would produce benefits in the future, that would amplify and augment my life, and that I would continue to grow and take an ever more confident place in the future. Those kids on that estate lived in a perpetual now of struggle. Struggle for basic necessities, food, shelter, before you even get to things like uh, love, warmth, support. 
And that was a real education, that some people have no sense of the future and no sense of the past, because the now is all they can deal with. Two years in Boston, I then decided to take those experiences and take them to the gritty inner city of Knightsbridge SW1. <laughs> I'm really going on, just to give it briefly... To give an idea of how different it was, at Boston, I used to be chaplain to a primary school where most of my work with the children involved getting them in and out of custody of one form or another. Um, when I went to Knightsbridge, I went into the school there where I was chaplain and had to take a, a register of people, uh, their names. And I went around and it was all these, um, these angelic-looking children who looked like they'd just stepped out of the Bowdoin Kids catalogue. And uh, ours, ours at Boston looked like they'd come out of Oliver. Um, <laughs> And I took their names, and they were all called Rupert and Tamara, of course. <laughs> Until I got to one little boy, angelic little boy, sitting there, and I said, what's your name? And he said, Tinos. Ah, Tinos. So I wrote down, and I said, and what's your surname? And he said, I am Tinos of Greece. <laughs> <laughs> and the question is, what is Christian ministry in the richest parish, in the richest city in the world? The answer is all the usual things, getting alongside people, in hatching and matching dispatching, and also getting people with wealth and surplus to have confidence that they could spend that money in more creative ways than kitchens, bathrooms, planes, boats, all that kind of thing. And that's what we did. We got alongside people and found ways of using surplus to invest in social good. And that's become, uh, I think, a very uh, important part of what I do now. I've just come back from Guernsey, where I've been talking to billionaires about how they might use some of their wealth creatively. Um, we'll make no comment about the low-tax environment they live in, but nonetheless. Um, very happy in London, very happy doing that. Was going to move to the neighbouring parish of, gritty inner-city parish of the Grosvenor Chapel, Mayfair. Um, but saw an ad in the Church Times, again one of those kind of moments of recognition. St Mary the Virgin, Findon, a church I knew from my childhood and loved, a place I knew from my childhood... And I just thought, mm, well, in another life, that would have been interesting. But I couldn't put it off. I set off a particular... Ended up, long and the short of it, I went up, was interviewed. The bishop said to me, if we offered you the job, would you take it? I opened my mouth to say no. But what came out was yes <laughs> instead. Um, and so I find myself now as the vicar of Finder. When I got back to London, a very glamorous friend of mine, a priest at the cathedral, bumped into me and he said, oh, I hear you're going to the Grosvenor Chapel Mayfair. And I said, no. I'm going to St Mary the Virgin Finder in the Diocese of Peterborough. And he said, what did the bishop catch you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and so it was, I find myself now back in Finder, living what must look like a very sort of uh, typical, patterned, Anglican, parsonical life. Of course, actually, the life of an Anglican pastor now is hugely different in so many ways. Parishes are hugely different in so many ways from what they were. But what you really are, I think is a wrangler, a whipper in, an encourager, a stimulator, an organiser of goodness. That's basically what our job is, to sustain at the heart of communities those lessons I'd learned, both in the gay community and later on uh, in, the, in, in the church, to continue to provide the pulse, the heartbeat that gives life and vigour and body to those virtues so difficult to quantify and yet are, that are essential to the good functioning of a community. Lose them, and those communities fray at the edges and invent, systematically, eventually, collapse at the centre. But they're absolutely fundamental. Our tradition, the Christian tradition, preserves them. What I learned in the gay community also, uh, I think, was a, was a rediscovery of them. And I think one of the things as a church we have to do now is to find ways of capturing some of that energy, enriching it with the experience of that tradition, and yet making it fit for purpose in radically different communities. One of the ways, of course, is about the deal we offer to lesbian and gay and trans people. In the wider society, we've come a long way in a short time about who thought a Conservative Prime Minister would bring in equal marriage. What a big surprise that was. Of course, in the church, that's a very different argument because uh, how we understand marriage, what we understand it to be, it's where it comes from. Uh, is a very different one, and we're in a very live debate about that. But I think a reality is, particularly if you look at the news at the moment, what's happening with Canon Jeremy Pemberton, who, as you know, has just lost in an employment tribunal when he was not given a licence so he could practise as an NHS chaplain because he upgraded his civil partnership to a marriage. I think that one's going to run and run. That's going to go to appeal. I wouldn't be at all surprised if that goes on 
as far as it can go, because it seems to me that the Church of England's present exemptions from equality legislation are not ones that are going to endure for long. And then we've got some work to do, because I don't think our standards should be imposed on us from outside bodies, but I do think we need to understand our place in that changing world. And I think one of the ways we can do that is to look precisely to those virtues that inform healthy communities. One of those, of course, is cr creating, providing and sustaining stable bonds. And so that's an interesting front, we've, I've gone on for far too uh, interesting front that we're fighting on now. This is such a random and uh, roundabout way of trying to draw together the themes that I put in the title of the lecture and then forgot about until I was on the train coming up this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll stop now, but um, if anyone has got, I know you're desperate for a cup of tea, but if anyone has got any sort of questions or wishes to challenge me or denounce me, that's absolutely fine. Um, have we got time? We haven't got time. We haven't quite got time, but... I'll be around after, if you wish to do any of that there, that would be fine. Yeah. I mean, friends, I'm Rachel Mewis, I'm the current Head of Theology and Religious Studies. I was asked to chair this part of the proceedings. I'm afraid that I've been given very strict instructions that we have to finish at four. Um, but Richard will be around to take questions afterwards. Richard, um, so if star quality is the ability to take the raw material of life um, and make it into art, we knew already before you came here that you were a great star, and we've seen that star quality fully displayed here, both the, the material of your own life, but one of the, the wonderful things is the way that you've drawn in the material of so many other people's lives, um, the material of culture and of politics and of society and of religion, um, and the material of, 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 of our country's history as well. Um, and I feel you've also given us, as, as, as the alumni, staff and community of the University of Leeds, something, something to think about what it is to be a university, um, to think deeply about the things that really matter, um, about the things that make people's lives work and that make our lives together work, and to think with real integrity um, and openness to challenge and vulnerability, and to accompany people on a formative and transformative stage of their own personal journeys, which is something that those of us who work in universities always feel as a tremendous privilege. And we feel most of all as a privilege when we see our alumni um, before us. Richard, thank you so much for everything you've given us. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank Richard. <laughs>